That's awesome. Well, guys, I'm excited. We have been in our uh, Beatitude series, and uh, we have been walking through the Beatitudes. Um, can anybody who was here last week tell me which Beatitude we covered last week? Blessed are the those who hunger and thirst, right, for righteousness. They will be filled. Uh, this week, we're going to jump in, and we're going to talk about the uh, next Beatitude, which is blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. Um, I want to go ahead and pray, and let's just jump in. Father, we just thank you this morning for your presence. We thank you that you are here with us. And right now, for the next few moments, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would release your word, that it would unlock places in us, that it would connect to places in us that would cause us to come alive. I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear of what you're revealing and what you are sharing with all of us wherever we are. We welcome your word in Jesus' name. Amen? Awesome. Well, let's just start here with Matthew 5. I want to just read back a couple of these Beatitudes. We can start in Matthew 5, verse 3, right? Jesus sat on the mountain and he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and who thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And here we go for today's beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful. I want to just kind of really jump in this morning really quickly. And I want to unpack this word mercy. I want to really dive deep into this. And what did Jesus mean? What was the intention behind this word mercy? Blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. So let's start here with what the Greek definition in this context is on mercy. So here we have, it's pronounced eliamon in Greek, and this is the word mercy that Jesus uses here. And look at this definition. It means to be full of pity that demonstrates compassion by word or deed to those who are miserable or afflicted in order to bring them relief, right? This is what the actual Greek definition means. It's to actually have pity and to have compassion, but did you catch that? Through word and deed to demonstrate that type of compassion. That same word, eliamon, comes from a root word, elios, which is E-L-E-O-S. It's the Greek word. It's the root word for that word. And guess what that word means in the Bible? Olive oil. Olive oil. So we know that olive oil is used in the Bible a lot. And there's a lot of instances the, the olive oil is used, oil is used. In the Old Testament, especially in the days of the tabernacle of Moses, God would instruct Moses and Aaron and the priests, and they would anoint the pieces of furniture like the ark and the things of the, the, the altar with oil because it set them apart for a special service. But besides the, that type of use, Oil in the Bible had medicinal purposes. Oil in the Bible was actually used to bring healing, right? And so in addition to setting apart for ministry, oil was actually used to treat wounds. It was used to bring soothing, comfort, healing. In fact, we could say it this way, oil was a healing agent that would bring relief to those who were suffering. This is what Jesus has in mind when he says, blessed are the merciful, because the reality way, the reality is, is that when we show mercy, when we practice mercy, when we give mercy, I want us to see this side of the coin, that we're just not feeling uh, compassion for someone, but we actually become agents of healing that could release healing and treat people's wounds. Mercy has the ability to heal. This is what Jesus was trying to get us in this beatitude. And he said, blessed are those who practice mercy, right? These are the core values of the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus really has a high value for mercy and those of us who would choose to practice and demonstrate it, right? And so the big idea here is that mercy is not passive, it's active, right? Mercy is not dormant or stagnant. 
It's like a movement. It moves. It goes. And because mercy is active, it has to be experienced. Mercy is part of who God is. And there's a, 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 a time and a space, just like we're doing here this morning, to define it, to illustrate it, to understand it a little bit better. But the reality is you and I have to actually experience God's mercy for it to become real in our life. Right? One of the first places in the Old Testament that mercy is displayed is actually in Exodus 25, verse 17 through 18, when the Lord gives Moses to make the Ark of the Covenant. All right, guys, I want you to check this out. It says, he told this to Moses, and you shall make a mercy seat. This is the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make the two cherubim of gold, right? These are the guardian angels that would be fastened on the Ark of the Covenant. And hammered work shall you make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Now, do we have a picture of the mercy seat? It's always better when you can see a picture of it. There we go. All right, do you see the two cherubim, the two angels with their wings touching each other? All right, and you see the cover, or that's the lid? That's what God was talking to most about. That is the mercy seat. That is the seat of mercy. And he says right here, this, this cover, this lid will actually work as a covering agent. Mercy will work as a covering agent over the Ark of the Covenant. Now, many of us may know this, some of us may not, and that's okay. But in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant was a place where God's presence dwelt among men. This was the, the pre-incarnate before Jesus comes on the scene. All right, this is God's presence centered around the Ark of the Covenant. But I want to remind us, there's a few things inside that box. We don't have time to unpack that all, but there are a few elements inside the Ark of the Covenant. Do you remember what they are? We know the Bible tells us that there's a golden jar of manna, right? There's the Aaron's rod that budded, and there's also part of the law. The Ten Commandments are in that. And you know what's fascinating to me is that when you look at the Ark of the Covenant from that lens, right, you, you see the law, you see the, the staff and the manna, and you have this mercy seat. And it was the priest's job once a year to go into the Holy of Holies and to take a blood sacrifice for an animal and sprinkle it on top of that mercy seat. So that mercy seat would actually be saturated in blood. And the Lord said that was going to be for the atonement of sins for the nation. Well, why is that all important to know? Because here's what's really interesting. If you take a deep dive in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, there are, there are times and seasons, especially through 1 Samuel, when King Saul neglects the Ark of the Covenant, when the priests lose the Ark of the Covenant to the Philistines, if you read all in those chapters of 1st, 2nd Samuel, you'll find one thing always surrounds the Ark of the Covenant. And you know what it is? Death. There's always somebody dying around the Ark of the Covenant in those pages. But when David brings the Ark back to Jerusalem, he begins to put blood back on the mercy seat, and all of the death stops. And I think what the Lord is teaching us, what the Bible is showing us, it's a principle of how God's mercy works. You see, think about it. If God himself was looking over at the ark and there's no blood, there's no mercy, then all there is is the effects, the condemnation that the law brings. Right? Paul says the letter of the law kills and brings death, but the Spirit brings life. But when the blood is applied over the mercy seat, then the Lord looks through mercy through the law. As I don't know about you, but I think that's incredible. Right, And so it just really begins to model this concept that God does not judge apart from mercy. God judges through mercy. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but one of the things that the enemy, our adversary, has us always be tempted to do is to make judgments about one another apart from mercy. Right? Because the reality is we live in a pretty judgmental culture. Some of us judge on the inside. Some of us judge on the outside, if we're really honest. But the reality is mercy keeps us in check. Mercy helps us see others through the perspective of God's lens. And so it's very, 
very important. Now, in the New Testament, mercy is not just a, a place, but it's a person. Um, in fact, it's so uh, amazing to me that when Jesus comes on the scene as our faithful high priest, he comes as a minister of mercy. And just when he does, he comes to give us relief from our anxiety. He comes to give us freedom from where we feel bound, right? The, the point, what I'm saying is that Jesus is a minister of mercy, and he longs to give mercy. He's a God of justice. He is. He's a God of judgment. But Jesus is also a God of mercy. And I don't know about you, but for me personally, how I've experienced mercy, this is Michael Thornton's definition. Michael Thornton's definition of mercy is this. It's when, when the very worst of who I am collides with the very best of who God is. That's mercy. See, I learned it's a place. Mercy is actually a place. He goes on to tell Moses in the Ark of the Covenant, he goes, I will meet with you at the mercy seat. Think about that in your own life. Mercy is a place where you can meet God and God can meet you. And a lot of times how it works is when we're the most undeserving, when we're the most underestimated, when we're carrying the most shame, when we're carrying the most just guilt in all of the things, the heaviness that life brings, even our decisions, that, that thing that comes upon us, that weightiness, it's oftentimes in that moment when we feel God the least, His mercy comes to us and it just begins to move in our lives. Has anybody ever experienced that before? That at your lowest moment, God breaks in. Right? That's His mercy. His mercy comes in these places. I call these mercy moments. Mercy moments. Our lives are filled with moments of God's mercy. Some of them may be big and some of them may be small. When I think about that, I think of uh, the Apostle Peter and Paul. You remember when Peter denies the Lord three times? He like denied him three times. But then when Jesus resurrects and he finds him on the shore, he's cooking them breakfast. He approaches Peter and he asks Peter three questions. He says, Peter, do you love me? Right? And we know at the third time, Peter just gets so convicted in a good way. And he's like, Lord, I know you love, I know you, I know you love me and I love you. And what is the point? The point is, here's Peter carrying this guilt and shame from denying Jesus. But Jesus' mercy is meeting him on that beach. And it's his mercy that swallows Peter's shame. God's mercy will swallow our shame. How about Paul? Said the Apostle Paul that while he was breathing threats and murdering the church, he was met on the road to Damascus by Jesus. In Paul's worst moment, in Paul's darkest moment, Jesus appears and he gives him mercy. You see, mercy moments have the ability to shift your life. They have the ability to inspire us, to change us, to transform us. They have the ability to literally redirect our lives. And I have a sense this morning that the Lord really wants to extend mercy to all of us. I feel that there's an invitation to a mercy moments. He wants to give you mercy moments. Maybe not just today, maybe this week. I had that sense when I was preparing. So I want to give us a few quick reminders about mercy today as we go on. These are some reminders about God's mercy that help me keep things in front of me of how important it is to practice and show mercy. So let's start here. Number one, mercy is compassion in action. I want you to remember that. Mercy is not just compassion. It's not just compassion for the poor or for people that are hurting. It's actually compassion in action. Hebrews 2, 17 through 18, right? We see Jesus model this. It says, therefore, he, Jesus, had to be made like his brothers in every aspect. What a mind-boggling thought so that he might become a merciful, there it is, I like that word, merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make appropriation for the sins of the people. And for because he himself had suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. 
right? Jesus didn't just have compassion for you and I, but his compassion actually drove him to action to lay his life down on the cross. That is mercy in action. And so what I've learned in the culture that we live in to modernize this a little bit more is that there's, a, there's, some, there's some entanglements that happen between what is sympathy, what is empathy, what is mercy? Are they all the same thing? How do they intermingle? And so I want to look at that. So let's, I got a few simple definitions. Let's look at sympathy first. All right, this is what sympathy means. Sympathy is a feeling of concern or compassion for someone who is experiencing something difficult without necessarily sharing those emotions. Sympathy is feeling generally sorry for somebody. Sympathy is feeling that concern for somebody that is hurting or distressed or in some type of trouble, right? You, you feel sorry for them. We feel, we feel moved. We feel that in our heart for them. Different than empathy. Empathy, on the other hand, is the ability to understand and share the feelings of others involving a deep emotional connection. So where sympathy says, you know, I feel sorry for you for, for what you're going through, Empathy actually connects to that because you experienced it, right? Empathy is like, I experience what you're going through right now. I can actually have empathy for you. I can identify with you. I can actually connect with you because of what you went through, right? That's sympathy. That's empathy. But mercy, a little bit different. So mercy does this. Mercy feels compassion for the person. Mercy has the ability to connect with them on emotional level, but here's the kicker, and actually does something to improve the condition. That's the difference of mercy. Are you catching it with me this morning? Mercy is compassion in action. Blessed are those who don't just feel sorry for their brother. Blessed are those who just don't connect and identify with them in a, in a good way. That's good. But blessed are those who actually move and respond to do something to help their brother out of the condition they're in. All right? That is mercy. Again, let me put it to you this way, how it works. Let me say it this way. Let's say you had a friend and they lost their job and it is devastating, right? Sympathy would say, gosh, I am so sorry you lost your job. I mean, I know that's got to be so difficult that you lost your job. Empathy would say, I am so sorry you lost your job. You know what? I know what it's like to lose a job because I've been jobless before. But mercy says, I am so sorry you lost your job. I can understand what that's like, but here's Here's money for the next three months for your rent and your groceries so you can get back on your feet, right? That's mercy. So when Jesus, again, is this core value, blessed are those who are merciful, he is talking about blessed are those who, yes, feel compassion, who feel that love, who actually feel that, 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 that feeling of helping somebody, but actually moves and does something about it. If I can really simplify it, Sympathy sees the problem, empathy connects to the problem, but mercy solves the problem. And when we choose to practice mercy towards one another, we become problem solvers in the kingdom. Mercy goes beyond sympathy. Sympathy is good. Empathy is good. But, but mercy goes beyond those. It goes beyond both of those. Mercy is getting inside a person's life. Mercy is crawling into somebody else's skin. Mercy is actually putting yourself in their shoes. Mercy is like looking into somebody's life and seeing life from their perspective. It's feeling what they feel, understanding where they're coming from, and seeing things how they see. And I'm going to tell you what, that is not easy. And that requires a lot of love. That requires a lot of selflessness. But Jesus is so powerful when he says, blessed are the merciful, because he's showing us that there's actually a way, there's an ability where we could actually do this, right? This is what Jesus did for us guys in Philippians chapter two, right? Remember in that verse, Philippians two, that he did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the nature of a servant as a slave and, and, and being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself to death, even death on the cross, 
right there, God exalted him to the highest place. Jesus demonstrated the ultimate act of mercy when he stepped out of his divinity, so to say, in heaven and stepped into these earth suits, this, this flesh, and demonstrated his love and kindness. Every beatitude we read, you will never find a place where Jesus didn't do it first. Jesus did it first. And so that's why the Bible defines mercy as olive oil. That's why mercy is healing to the soul. Mercy is healing to the wounds, the emotional wounds, and the the wounds that we pick up in life as Christians and believers. Mercy has the ability to bring relief to all the church wounds that we have or all the other family wounds and issues that we have. When we actually show mercy to one another, it heals us in deep places. You see, I want to I want to encourage us again. We are, do you know this, that we are all ministers in this room. As New Testament church, as believers in Christ, the Bible is very clear that we are a kingdom of priests. And that because we are a kingdom of priests, because we are the priesthood of the believers, that means every one of us in this room who choose to follow Jesus is a minister. Now, you may not be a pastor or some prophet or teacher, but we are all, as a body of Christ, called to be ministers. And the Greek word for minister is servant. It's to serve. And one of the primary things the Lord wants us to minister is mercy. He wants us to be ministers of mercy to our co-workers, to our families, to our friends. And let me tell you the beautiful thing about mercy. It's like a boomerang. Anybody ever throw a boomerang before? What happens when you throw a boomerang? I come back at you. So when you pour out mercy, the Lord has a beautiful way of that mercy coming back to your life. But if we hold withhold mercy, that boomerang won't never come back. It'll just go out, right? So mercy is like a cycle that works within us. The more we give it out, the more we receive. The more we give it out, the more we receive. So number one, mercy is compassion in action. Number two, second reminder of mercy. This is a big one. I found that there's some enemies of mercy. And I think, too, the biggest enemies of mercy is rigidness and revenge. Rigidness and revenge can be two of the greatest hindrances of us practicing and showing mercy to one another. Let's go to Luke 7, 36 through 47. This is the story of when Jesus goes into Simon the Pharisee's house, and there's this scene where they're all having dinner, And the sinful woman, the Bible says, comes and breaks the alabaster jar over Jesus and wipes wipes her feet with her hair and just begins to to minister to Jesus. And Simon, the the, the Pharisee, has a very difficult time with this scene. So let me pick up in verse 36. It says, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house, and Jesus reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner... When she leaned that he was reclining at the table and the Pharisee's house brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her hair and tears and wiped them from her hair and her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with, with ointment. And when the Pharisee had invited, he saw this. Here's what I want you to know. Look at what Simon says. He says to himself, if this man were really a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is touching him, for she is a sinner. I want to stop right there. Gosh, I know we read that and we're like, we put ourselves in that situation. I would never do that. But we kind of do do that, don't we, in life all the time. We do it. Sometimes you don't even recognize it. What Jesus is pointing out here is that Simon the Pharisee had a rigidness in him. He had a rigid perspective of the woman that came to minister to Jesus. And what I've learned is as believers, we can get rigid sometimes and not even fully realize that we're rigid. Rigidness is the core of legalism. At the core of legalism is rigidness. And I believe as believers, if we become rigid, it makes us cold. It makes us unwelcoming. 
that makes us uninviting. You know, we can become like that. The church can become like that. We can become rigid in our ways and not even realize it. You know what I've learned is that rigidness in the church or a church atmosphere environment, it makes people no longer able to feel like they're free. They feel controlled. They feel constrained. They feel constricted. They feel bottled up. All right? Because in an environment where there is more rigidness than there is mercy, we usually tend to measure ourselves by what other people think. Got quiet in here. Rigidness fights over the details. Rigidness gets lost in the weeds. But mercy, it gives us a higher perspective. Mercy helps us to see the details through a completely different lens. So we don't get stuck in the small things that bog us down, but we stay up in a higher place where Jesus is in seeing from his perspective. In my own experience, rigid people can tend to be some of the most unhappy people or not so happy people that there are. But Jesus says, blessed, happy are those who are merciful, for they will obtain mercy. See, there's a freedom in mercy. There's a flexibility in mercy. When we choose to show mercy, there's actually a flexibility that comes. There's a freedom that comes that causes us to grow, right? And it also gives us room to make room for each other's faults. When we, when we demonstrate mercy, we practice mercy, we give one another an opportunity to mess up without bringing the hammer down. Are you following me this morning? Right? It keeps us in the game with one another. And so that's what Jesus is addressing here. He's addressing Simon's rigidness. Perhaps maybe some of us this morning have become rigid. Maybe there's places in our hearts that have become rigid. I want to encourage you this morning, choose mercy. Practice mercy. And then you will, you will watch the healing balm of Jesus flow through you. And you will find yourself stepping into a freedom that you have not tasted in quite some time. Besides uh, rigidness, revenge is the other enemy to mercy. Or retaliation, we could say. The word means actually uh, to vindicate means justice as well. And Simon the Pharisee wanted to see this woman come to the justice of the law. And what we find is that, I, I find this, is that we live in a culture today that, that praises justice but looks down on mercy. We find revenge satisfying and we find mercy really weak. Our culture prides itself on retaliation and justice and mercy and showing compassion to those who wrong us is a way counterculture way of thinking. But I want to remind us what the scripture says in Romans 12, 17 through 21. Look at this. This is the kingdom. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, this is a big one. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, right? This is how the kingdom operates. And a lot of times, a lot of times we want or we act out in vengeance or retaliation, but we relabel it as justice because we really don't know what the biblical definition of justice is. And for most of us, you know, it's, that's a struggle, isn't it? It's a, it's a struggle sometimes to fight that mindset in us, especially if we're hurt by somebody or wronged by someone. Isn't it hard sometimes to fight that mindset that goes, I'm going to get you back. Oh, you got me? I'm about to get you. Like, I'm coming for you. Oh, you don't hurt me. Oh, it's on now. I, I'm not the only one who has this thoughts, right? Mm-hmm. 
right? These are thoughts. These are, these are things we have to battle. This is counterculture to the kingdom that Jesus is, is, is giving us. And so instead of that, the Lord is saying, what does it look like for you to not forsake justice? This isn't about minimizing justice and throwing justice out the window, but this is about, this is about understanding mercy and justice and how the two are both, both to be married together. I feel the enemy would love nothing more than to compartmentalize justice for mercy and make you and I choose one or the other. But like I said earlier, the way God does it is he judges through mercy, right? And so if we actually judge, and there are some things we are to judge, the Bible says, but I want to encourage us that when we do make judgments, we must make them through mercy. Because the Bible also says that if we judge without mercy, then you and I will be judged with mercy out mercy. James 2.13. Do you have that one up there? James outlines this. He says, for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And that's what James is telling us. He's saying, listen, when we do judge, we must do it through the lens of mercy. If we judge apart from mercy, we will become legalists and rigid at our core. But when we judge through mercy, we have an opportunity to deliver the truth in love, to deliver the truth in mercy, to deliver the truth in compassion in such a way that Jesus will begin to bring conviction in his own justice to those situations and to those people that we are battling. Can I get an amen this morning? All right? So I want us to consider that. A lot of times we are always going to have opportunities to retaliate, to repay back. And I'm not saying it's easy. But what I am encouraging us is to take caution in the word here. And, and before we satisfy that desire to get even, what I just want to ask yourself, what does it look like? Just ponder what would it look like to actually give mercy? I don't know if you guys remember, but one of the most powerful stories for me on this was the Amish story. Do you remember when uh, some years ago there was a school, an Amish school where a gunman when in, this is a real story. A gunman went into a school and he murdered, he, it was a mass shooting, and he killed several Amish girls in the schoolhouse. Does anybody remember that? So that really happened, and it rocked the Amish community. But what was amazing was the Amish's response to that murder and that tragedy. And the man that, that, that killed those little girls, several of them, actually had a wife and three kids of his own. And they had no idea that he did that. They had no idea that he went and did this. He was a milkman deliverer for the Amish school. And he just went, he just went crazy one day and opened fire. Well, it rocked the community. Obviously, you can imagine the grief. Could you imagine the retaliation as a dad of five, as a dad of four girls? I couldn't even begin to imagine the thoughts I would have to battle. Because we're human. But what I love about this Amish community is do you know how they responded? We, we know, if you look online, you could find out they actually did a press release and they forgave them. They forgave the killer for doing that. But that was just one thing. A lot of people don't know the rest of the story because when they did the burial of all the girls, I mean, it was, it was, it was hard. So many people out to that. The press was out to that. But a couple days later, they actually buried the killer. Nobody was there. But guess who came to that funeral? The victims of the Amish families. And they went to the widow and the three kids and they loved on them and they supported them. And for the next several years, they raised money and financial support and donations that funded the widow and her babies, the victims of these families. Mercy. They chose mercy, compassion and action. They could have, they, if anybody had a right to retaliate, they could have retaliated, but they chose not to do so. They showed mercy. Here's something else I love about mercy. It comes from Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Some of you may know this verse. The steadfast of the Lord never ceases, right? His mercies never come to an end. That means there's an infinite, there's an infinite bank of mercy that God has. But this next part, I love this, don't you? They are new every morning. Someone once said, there's nothing new under the sun, right? Ecclesiastes Solomon but man, what if there is actually his mercies are new every morning? To illustrate this, 
I want you to think of mercy like rain. You know, the Lord's done His work. He died on the cross. He resurrected. His mercies are available every single second. And just like rain, imagine a rainstorm. Imagine a long rain that comes. His mercy is like rain. It just continually falls. Now, if you and I were a plant in a garden, or if we were a flower in a garden, right, that rain would nourish us. That rain would saturate and nourish our, 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 our root system, and we would grow. But when we choose not to show mercy, and we choose to be rigid, or we become rigid, or we become vengeful and take on that attitude, then it's like taking a plastic tarp cover over us as a flower. And even though it's raining, that rain is not hitting us. And eventually that flower will die because it doesn't have any water or nutrients. And in the same way, if we choose to live that way, even though the mercies are falling all around us, we can miss out on it if we harbor these things in our hearts. And spiritually, we too will die on the inside, right? But the beautiful thing about this is that mercy is like rain. It's always falling. And if we open ourselves up, if we receive his mercy, it will always produce spiritual life and harvest in our life. I don't know about you, but that's a good word. Blessed are the merciful. Last one, we'll end here. Mercy is to be received before it's given. It's a good reminder about mercy. Mercy is to be received before it's given. Mercy operates just like forgiveness. Can we go back to the woman uh, in Luke 7, 41 through 47? One of the Pharisees asked to eat with him at the table. Okay, I think it's in verse uh, 41. Can you go to verse 41? Okay, and Jesus answered, says, Simon, I have something to say. And he answered, say it, teacher. Here we go. You did not anoint my head. Oh, there we go, 41. <laughs> we got it. Certain money lender had two debtors. One, this is Jesus responding back to the, to the Pharisee. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Why then could they not pay? He canceled the debt of both when they couldn't pay. Now, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered this house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You have given me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. I want you to hang in here with me. This is a really good, good point to what Jesus is showing us here. You gave me no kiss, but from the time in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, here we go, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Gosh, and I want you to catch that this morning because this is how mercy operates. It operates like, just like forgiveness. What Jesus is saying is this, your capacity to receive mercy will always determine your capacity to give it. To the degree and to the amount of mercy you receive for your personal life, will be to the degree and to the amount that you could actually give it out to other people. And so what Jesus is teaching Simon, he's saying, if you only experience a little bit of the Father's mercy, then you're only going to have a little bit to pour out when it's needed. But like this woman, if you come to Jesus and you open up everything and you allow to re him to re you receive mercy for all the broken places in your life, then you will be forgiven much, and then you will have much mercy. And then that mercy will over spill and pour out in front of many. So I want us to remember that my capacity, my capacity to receive Jesus' mercy will determine how much mercy I can give out. So if you're here this morning and you find it's actually a lot easier for me to give justice than it is mercy, then I would encourage you, ask the Lord, is is there some things in my life, in my heart, is there some levels of mercy that I need to receive for me that I haven't received yet?
A lot of times we have to battle through our own shame and our own guilt because we don't think we're worthy enough. But I promise you one thing this morning, guys, you are worthy enough because he died for you and he died for me. He, you're so worthy that he is ready to pour out the riches of his mercy on you when you ask him for it. All right? So let's end here. Practical ways how, how you can actually receive mercy. We could do it right here. Number one, you show mercy. When you show mercy, it positions you to receive it. I, listen, this list is not like you do A and then B follows. That's not this. What this is, is that if we demonstrate this, it positions us to get the reign of mercy. So when you show mercy, you will, give, you will get mercy. Faith, an act of faith. I've learned that when you take an act of faith, anybody in this room ever had the Lord just lead you to do something pretty wild and crazy that made no sense? It was a risk. When we take acts of faith, it positions us to receive mercy, right? How about this humility? Man, this is one of the core values of the kingdom. When I choose humility, I position myself to be recipient of God's mercy in worship, right? When we live a lifestyle that worship him, we position ourselves to receive mercy. And I love this last one, giving. When we, when we give, when we give financially, when we give of our time, our energy, it also positions us to receive God's mercy, his mercy. I want everybody to stand with me this morning. Can the worship team come back up? Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. You guys can just start playing. I just had a sense this morning that the Lord wanted to provide some mercy moments for us. Because I had a sense that there's some of us in here that could really, really use some mercy right now. And I just want to encourage you that the Lord is in the house to give it. And I also want to encourage you that it just doesn't happen in this moment. It, it could happen this week. It could happen as we walk out. But let this be a starting point this morning. Have you ever reflected back in your life? Can you think of moments where the Lord showed you mercy? How about think of the people that God's positioned in your life to help you get to where you are right now? I remember when I was at uh, Potter's Wheel. It's a drug program. And I had uh, graduated and I was, I was going to stay there and and the Lord opened the door to go to Bible college, which at that time was just a big deal. I also had something, a debt hanging over my head. To go through a six-month in-house program like that to get sober and clean and saved and everything the Lord did in my life, it came with a financial cost. It was $21,000. My bill at rehab after six months was $21,000. It was back in 2004. Now, you know, somebody that's been in recovery or a long-term program, <laughs> you just don't have $21,000 to pay the bill back. Don't even have a job. Most have been in prison. Most have, won't get hired because they're cons. So how do you even go about paying something like that? And I remember that the man that ran the facility, the owner, we had a conversation, and he said, before I left, he goes, you know what, Michael, I'm not going to track you down. He said, I'm not, I don't operate that way. I'm not going to send you invoices. He said, because here's how we operate here. He said, if you truly got what you came here for, then I know there's no way you can leave this place and not want to try to make a way to pay it back. He operated on an honor system like that. He was right. And I remember in my heart feeling like, man, Lord, I have to, I have to pay this back because you've done so much now in my life. But I didn't know how to pay it. I didn't know where to start. And in that conversation, he said, I tell you what, if you go to Bible college, and I was going for a two-year associate's degree, he goes, if you finish your two-year degree, consider your debt paid for, $21,000. He said, but I have to see a diploma. Can I tell you something, guys? I went, I did it. Two years later, I graduated with my associates. He was in the audience, and he said, your debt's paid for I know I said a lot this morning, but if you can remember this, 
Mercy pays your debt. Mercy will pay your debt. And so if you're weary, if you're tired, it's okay. There's room for you here this morning. And so we have some amazing people here. Some, we have some amazing prayer servants and folks that love to pray. So I want to invite you guys up forward. If you could come down here at the altar. And if you're here this morning, I, I don't want you to let the opportunity get away from you. If you need prayer for anything, I want you to come down and let these guys pray for you. Maybe you're going through a battle, a valley. Maybe there's something you need to just to release and you need agreement with. I want, you to, I want you to invite you down this morning. Come on down here and find mercy. Maybe you just want to come and worship the Lord and, and just worship Him and pray and get some things off. These altars are open. I want to invite you. So I'm going to pray. And if that's you, come on down this morning. Jesus, I thank you that your mercies are new every morning and that it cancels the debt off of our lives. And so this morning, we thank you for the fountain of mercy that is here before us. And I pray that you would move mightily in all of our hearts this morning. One of the best ways to receive mercy is just to ask for it. Just to ask for it. Sometimes we don't even realize we ask for justice more than we ask for mercy. And so, Jesus, we ask for mercy this morning. We ask for mercy for our lives. We thank you. In Jesus' name. So if that's you, come on down this morning and get some prayer. Yeah, Jesus, we love you. We love you. We honor you. We thank you. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning. We thank you that you're a merciful and faithful high priest. And I pray that you would pour out your mercies today over everyone in this house, every family represented, everyone watching online. I pray that in a day of judgment, in a day of justice, Lord, that we would find pockets of your mercy that you would release your mercy from heaven. Lord, that it would fall like rain, that it would water our hearts, that it would water our souls, that it would water our nation and our country, that it would water this place. Lord, let your mercy fall like rain. Let it fall like a refreshing wane. God, I just see the Lord bringing a relief to some of us this morning. I see a wind blowing through a window, and I just feel like where some of you just have felt just so oppressed I just, saw, I just saw oppression leaving. I saw heaviness leaving. I saw wind blowing through the window. I saw a, a fresh wind, a fresh wind that is coming. It said in Acts chapter 1 and 2 that when they were gathered in the upper room in one accord, that there was a sound from heaven, that there was a wind that came from heaven and began to blow through the room. We welcome your wind, Holy Spirit. We welcome the wind of your spirit. We welcome the wind of your love. We welcome the wind of your refreshing to come in this place. We thank you now. We thank you, Lord.
awesome. And so, Lord, we just seal everything today. And we bless your holy name. We love you. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.